We seem at times, in our recent past, to have touched that dream, overthrowing a dictatorship, regaining freedom of speech and assembly, achieving small victories for justice and the respect of human rights for the majority of Haitians, marginalized during the past 200 years of internal colonialism. But the harsh realities of today's Haiti have now made that dream more distant and elusive, with news of a country besieged by gangs, of people kidnapped, killed or displaced, of children going hungry, or so many fleeing Haiti in droves as they did during the Duvalier dictatorship or the military regime. But this time, it looks like the country is being drained of the chances of building a tomorrow as the young and educated are leaving, with more than 85% of them now living abroad, a frightening statistics. Forced to live away from home after 30 years of our common struggle for change in Haiti, I find myself wondering, was the heavy price we paid to change Haiti, was that in vain? Today's celebration of the Metanoa Community Learning Center and the school has a special meaning for me as it brings hope back. Messieurs qui parlaient en vain, Bledio, merci, vous savez porter pour moi aujourd'hui. L'espoir. It is very personal also. It is very personal also, as I can imagine what it could have meant for my husband, Jean Dominique, who championed our mother tongue, our culture, our heritage, and put the radio station he owned on the line in the struggle for a democratic Haiti. Jean was assassinated in the courtyard of Radio Haiti four years after Chris and Abner founded LKM. He must be so proud, wherever he is, of this L'Ecole Tête en Haut, that school with heads up high. Seeing on screens and pictures the fruit of 25 years of patient work, seeing the smiles of confident and joyful children creating their own books, they are there, in their own language, proud of their culture and their community, brings back the utopian dream of a society free from the straitjacket of our class interests and prejudices, free from 200 years of internal colonialism. So many of us have fought for that dream, each in our own spheres. It has been a long, difficult and exhilarating journey. Creole as the language shared by all Haitian was and is the most powerful tool we have. The battle for Creole started in earnest 20 years ago, before L'Ecole Communauté Matinois was launched in La Bonave. At that time, children were taught only in French, even if they never spoke it at home, memorizing texts they did not understand. You can still hear today the sing-song of school children endlessly repeating the same phrases when you walk near a school in the streets of Port-au-Prince today. I remember as a child myself being forbidden to speak Creole with friends in the schoolyard of the Catholic school where I went. And I remember my brother being punished multiple times for doing so in his school having to memorize as punishment paragraphs from Virgil in Latin, bringing a linguistic dichotomy to the absurd. When my husband, Jean Dominique, launched Radio Haiti and Terre in the early 70s, Creole was only used in the media for advertising and entertainment. We lived then under the second part of the Duvalier 29 years dictatorship, Jean-Claude Duvalier having, quote unquote, inherited our country from his father. Censorship was still the rule. The station started with cultural programs, as social and political issues were still taboo. In these early years, we could not even report on the accumulation of garbage in the street as it was seen as political, tarnishing the image of the regime. We turned to the exploration of the incredibly rich culture of the majority of Haitians, a culture anchored in a history of resistance, 
a culture expressed in a language Creole. By doing so, we often antagonize our French-speaking public who could not understand, for instance, why a program of classical music would be presented in Creole, as if the appreciation of Mozart or Beethoven should only be reserved to French speakers. At the time, debates about Creole had started in intellectual circles, with discussions on whether Creole could express the complex realities of the modern world, whether science and technology could be taught in Creole, whether speaking Creole would further isolate Haiti. These debates were, of course, in French. But a parallel movement had also started among writers and playwrights who started producing in Creole. Franck Etienne's play, uh, a Haitian writer, Franck Etienne's play in Creole, Pelentet, was in 1979 drawing larger crowds than the regime could tolerate and a censorship decree cut short the performances. But that same year, 1979, paradoxically brought a milestone in education and the recognition of Creole, a landmark law, and I quote, authorized the use of Creole in the schools. With children being taught for the first four years in the modern tongue, the only language they speak at home, with French being introduced later as a foreign language. Creole was then standardized, the reform initiated by then Minister of Education, Joseph Bernard, came with a large international support and funding, which might explain why the reluctant regime went along with it. But no real assessment of the program, which was put on hold in 1987, has been done, but it sent shock waves through the system. Amazingly enough, the main backlash came from parents. As Abner said earlier, uh, parents who did not speak French but vehemently raised their voices against what they called the second-rate education, meaning an education in their own language. More than 40 years later, the Metanois Community Learning Center and LKM are proving them wrong. At the time, At the time, the Bernard reform could not gather enough steam to affect the lives of the majority of Haitian children. But I was moved when Chris sent me a letter from the regional office of the Ministry of Education in Lagonave on the elimination of corporal punishments in the schools. It is dated February 2022. The letter is yes in Creole. At At Radio Haiti by 1979, we had established a structured newsroom using side by side on equal footing the language of the vast majority of Haitian, Creole, as well as the traditional language of the media, French. What we did above all was to lend our microphone to people who had been forced into silence for two centuries and years of repression. A coffee grower in the village of Marmelade could, could hear an interview from a peasant in the mountains above Jacmel about the low price he received from the middleman for his crop. And both could compare with the price of coffee on the international markets that Radio Haiti would broadcast. With news in Creole came for us the exploration of that so-called pays en dehors, the outside country, which has always been the world of the majority of Haitians who for so long have been defined and have defined themselves as un andeo, people from the outside country, outside of the main cities, outside of public life, outside of any decision making. There was in the process subtle, a subtle exchange between our Creole broadcasters and our Creole audience. When we covered the overthrow of dictator Anastasio Somoza, the Bailey in 1979 in Nicaragua. We brought the outside world to Haitian villages, but we also used expressions from what we call Creole Daki, a way Creole speakers have of using expressions understood by all without calling a spade a spade or a dictator a dictator. Somoza was dubbed Machuerwon, round jaw, a subtle reference to our chubby Duvalier, 
with a direct reference by our own uh, about our own situation. The use of Andaki expressions carried on from our slavery and maroon past when our ancestors had to dodge repression from the slave owner helped in turn to enrich, enrich our own broadcasting language. The battle for the recognition of Creole was always closely linked to the struggle for freedom and human rights in Haiti. In 1980, the Duvalier regime crushed the burgeoning movement for democracy. Our journalists were jailed, sent into exile in a vast repression that touched not only the media, but human rights defenders and political parties. In 1986, the muzzle that silenced the country's population for five more years fell off and the regime was overthrown. The popular phrase at the time, la bouquette la tombe, meant that people equated freedom to freedom of speech and freedom to speak Creole, their own language. When people said, la bouquette la tombe, they really meant we can speak out. And we can speak out in our own language and say what we want about what we are going through. The fall of the dictatorship brought an amazing burgeoning of Creole texts in writing, songs, and of course, the media. French and Creole were recognized in 1987 as the two official languages of Haiti. But the question remains, what has really changed in our stratified society? When I came back from my second exile after, yeah, I had three of them. Uh, when I came back from my second exile after another military coup, it was in 1994, I remember covering the trial of a market woman accused of murdering her husband. The man was a heavy drinker who would beat her repeatedly. What I saw in that courtroom was a semantic confrontation of two cultures, the culture of the West and that of the outside country. Immacula was being tried in French in a court of law, and she did not understand what was being said about her, and not even why she was arrested. When the witnesses spoke Creole, the lawyers or the judge would translate the testimonies from Creole to French, even though everyone in that courtroom, of course, understood Creole. We all speak Creole, all Haitians. The poor woman tried to say in Creole that she had simply thrown three small pebbles on the body of the dead man, so he wouldn't come back and haunt her. They were saying in French, which she did not understand, that she had killed him. The three pebbles could not have possibly killed the man, but the prosecutor said so, and he spoke French. So he must have been right, and Immacula was sent to prison. Immacula's case is not unique, as French is still the language used in court proceedings or records of parliamentary debates. All formal administrative documents are in French, not in both languages, as originally intended in the 1987 Constitution, with at times unintended consequences. For instance, amendments to that constitution, the 1987 constitution, voted by, by parliament in French in 2012, are being questioned by some as they were not voted on in both languages. Since the fall of the dictatorship in 1986, Creole has taken an expanding space on the public square, in radio stations that have sprung like mushrooms after the rainy season, on WhatsApp, on so many online platforms, on social media, we have come a long way. The battle for the parity of the two languages in Haitian lives is yet to be won. French, the language of, the domin of a dominant minority, still remains the passport to class promotion in a still profoundly unequal society. But that parity seems to have been achieved beyond Haiti's borders. An investigation, an investigative expose uh, was published last month in the New York Times, if many of you probably read it, called The Ransom. It was about Haiti's independence debt that, that France 
the colonial power kept extracting from Haiti years after a slave uprising defeated Napoleon's army. It was called the Double Death. To me, an interesting 26 aspect of that remarkable piece, a special 16-page section, followed by a series of five French front, front page French uh, no, front page uh, stories, was that the online version was also in Creole and French. I'm convinced at any rate that the century-long stigma attached to our mother tongue will slowly fade away with each child at Metanoa or elsewhere being valued, with each child finding his own or her own voice and feeling free. Piti piti zwezo fanishli, says the Haitian proverb, slowly does the bird build its nest, twig by twig. Today one school, tomorrow all 240 schools in Lagunav will follow the lead of Bethenwa, teaching in the children's mother tongue, unleashing the potential and the creativity of so many. The rest, giving an enthusiastic and committed team at Metanwa the possibility of building that future is in your collective hands. Matenwa needs you. Thank you.